Hello and welcome along to this special episode of the Literary Salon podcast. I'm Megan from Team Salon. Some of you will know me from our monthly indie bookshop tours on Instagram Live, in which I get to chat with brilliant booksellers from around the globe. Well, we have some news for you, as well as those, we are now also starting some specially curated Instagram Live interviews with amazing authors. And we did one of those recently and we just thought, you know what, we want to share that with you here on the podcast too, because it was such a great chat. It was with the one and only Jojo Moyes, who was in conversation with our guest host, Alex Clark. Now, Jojo's novels have sold over 51 million copies worldwide, hit the number one spot in 12 countries, have been translated into 46 languages, my goodness, and one of her best-selling books was adapted into a film starring Sam Claflin and Amelia Clark. She's just published her 16th novel, Someone Else's Shoes, and we were thrilled to catch her for this interview as it was first hitting the UK bookshops. So I'm going to hand you over to the wonderful journalist and broadcaster Alex Clark, who chatted with Jojo on our Instagram, and I really hope you'll enjoy it. Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Clark, and I am here to have a lovely conversation with the writer Jojo Moyes, who yesterday published her 16th novel, Someone Else's Shoes, and she is going to be joining us in a second, and we are going to talk about it. We're going to talk about her other books. We're going to have questions from you, I hope. Do just uh, send us whatever questions you have in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. It's really nice to see all of you here, and what better a way to welcome in Friday evening. So bear with us as we wait for Jojo to join us, uh, which I'm sure she will do in a second. Here I am. Hey, hi. Techno hi. man is on the scene. How, <laughs> How are you? I'm all right. How are you? I'm very well. We're going to be talking for half an hour or so. Okay. And we're going to welcome in all these people I can see just joining all the time. I'm sure they'll be asking us questions. But it is lovely to see you again. Jojo, I'm going to start Thank by you, saying Alex that the last time we met one another, we were in the same place, although you wouldn't exactly call it the same room. We weren't <laughs> Burma, were we? No, we were actually in a pool, Alex. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I see. We're going straight there. We're going straight there. Yeah, we were both on a, a literary cruise um, on the Queen Mary, which was uh, very good fun and... Um, exhausting in a I think we we all went quite hard for the week um we, we and lived very, well yes and did a lot of hard, things it was go hard or go home or possibly go over the side wasn't it really <laughs> but I have to say we were doing lots and lots of events we were really working hard I mean, we worked very hard I mean I, I was only talking been, about work yeah absolutely. very very hard and then we had lovely uh lovely evenings out too but it was one of those things where one was, you, we were really together a lot. I mean, you, yes. you, you're on a boat, there's not an enormous uh, space for kind of solitude. But one of the things that you could do in the little bit of afternoon that you had free was to go to the spa and laze around in the pool. And the reason that I'm so delighted to be asked to do this evening, to talk to you this evening, is that you have clearly forgiven me the fact that I blanked you in oh, the pool. No. We, I kept swimming past and going for my little spits and then, you know, washing my hair and coming back and having a bubble and all this kind of a thing. And I kept thinking, that's not, I don't think that's Jojo. Now, bear in mind, look, glasses, didn't have my glasses on. And I thought, yeah. no, that's not Jojo. It was, I said to her, it wasn't you in the pool this afternoon and it was indeed you. Yeah, but I didn't take offence because I got my eyes lasered last year and until that point, I would have walked. I would have swum past you equally blindly. So I absolutely forgiven. No, no there offense must taken. Have been a conscious thing where I very much wanted to believe it wasn't you. Because who wants to? Be <laughs> no one wants to be seen in a pool. Kind of no. Anyway, never. this is all. This is the old old sea dogs tales. Yes. We might say, but we had such fun, and we also did a couple of events together that were huge fun. So I know that you're brilliant at talking about your work and at talking to readers, and I'm just full of congratulations to you, Jojo, for this fabulous book. Someone oh, else thank can you. Thank you it's so great. much. Congratulations on publication. Now tell me, I did see 
on uh, on Twitter yesterday, you said, oh, you know, here is my new book, it's published today. It's been three and a half years, you said, which is more of a gap than, than normal. So it's going back into that swing of publication. How mm. has it felt for you? Really strange in a way that I was totally unprepared for. And I don't think it's just the gap of time. I think it's what we've all been through. I think Something else happened. Like most, yeah, there was, I, I meant to take a year off and then instead we had a pandemic and like everybody else i think i've just become less good at communicating and being in rooms of people and uh it just all feels a little bit more challenging than it used to but um i'm going to pretend that nobody else is here alex and it's just you and i and it's going to be fine we're just just catching up yeah we're just we're just doing a we're just doing a a facetime aren't we We Uh, it's it's all good um so Tell us this, that we are, you know, here we are, the pandemic, as you say, happened. Were you writing throughout it? Is this book, which is quite, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a book, it's a chunk. Mm. Um, tell us, was it, did it bo- was it born out of the pandemic? No. And in fact, I felt like writers divided into those who became really prolific. I mean, Jodie Piku, who is a friend of mine, Every time I emailed her, it felt like she'd written another book. And at that point, all I could do was sort of walk around the garden and and cook stuff and try and, you know, assuage my own anxiety about the globe and everything in general. And I would say the first year, 18 months, I just couldn't write a word. I think I managed a short story. I wrote a short story called Lou in Lockdown, which was a kind of free uh, 5,000 word story that we put out on the Penguin website just to try and cheer people up. But beyond that, I felt incapable. My brain sort of turned to cotton wool. And I think there were quite a few of us felt like that. It just became really hard to create in a time of kind of great anxiety. Um, But then when I did think about writing again, what I realized was that during that whole sort of two year period, my tastes had changed and I didn't want to be made sad. I didn't want to read something dark. I I wanted to watch rom-coms and kind of good old fashioned movies. And I wanted yeah. to read things that might possibly have a happy ending. And so in the end, I realized that was what I wanted to write too. I wanted to write the kind of thing that I wanted to read at that point. So that's, this is where this now, listen, this book, as we know, has just come out. So we are not today people to have read through the kind of 400 pages so we're going to resolutely everybody joins we are not there are no spoilers no spoilers we can't really talk about the book unless we sort of discuss the basic premise yeah. and I say to all our viewers that, that that is not a spoiler really it happens very very quickly and it yeah. is well it's kind of everybody's worst nightmares all sort of rolled into to one it actually starts funnily enough we were talking about not wanting to be seen uh sweaty uh in yeah. a sweat. it kind of starts in precisely that sort of arena doesn't it tell us a bit about how we begin someone else's yeah well it begins in a gym in a communal changing room and it's two women who are at very different ends of a kind of social spectrum one is wealthy american uh quite um what's the word spiky she's not an easy person to be around and she's just discovered that her husband of many years is about to divorce her and at the other end we have sam who is uh british uh lower middle class she is she works for a print firm she is part of what i think we would call the squeezed middle she has fractious elderly parents who require a lot of her time she has a teenage daughter she has a husband who is suffering depression but refuses to do anything about it she feels like she's the one holding everything up and financing the family and she has a boss who clearly wants to get rid of her rid of her younger male boss who's decided she's a waste of space in the office and these two women meet at a crisis day in both their lives and accidentally swap gym bags. And it's what <laughs> happens when they are literally forced to walk in each other's shoes. And that's Which the start is of it. easier said than done. Well, sort of for both of them in a way, but I suppose physically speaking, particularly for Sam, who I must say I'm rather kind of on her side here, because mm. I think if the book had me as Sam, it would not get past page three because I would have broken my leg trying to walk <laughs> in the Louboutins that she yeah. had 
accidentally finds herself in posi possession of with nothing else. Equally difficult, though, in another kind of way, for Nisha, who has never worn a gym fit flop, let alone a sturdy pump in her life. No, she's germ-phobic, and she's very exacting about what she will wear anyway. And for her, the idea of horror of having to, to wear somebody else's shoes full stop, but she is pushed into a position where she has nothing else but the gym bag that she is holding. And, you know, it's kind of a farce. It's an old fashioned caper, this story. Um, I was thinking about sort of trading places for menopausal women or um, <laughs> desperately seeking Susan, but with a pair of shoes instead. I just love those stories where two lives intersect and their fortunes ebb and flow and you know even Vanity Fair if you want to go back historically I just love those things where you have two contrasting sets of fortunes and, and ways of handling things and that was the fun bit to write. Well I guess for the reader and it must have been for you as you were creating it the difficulty is to work out in a sense who is the more disadvantaged and horrified and flummoxed by their apparent mm. new life and again, that swaps throughout, doesn't it? That, that is it not does. their fortunes ebb and flow. And in fact, the, the book sort of climaxes at a point when I, I, I sort of sat there when I first thought about this book and I thought, what would Nisha's absolute worst nightmare be? And I can't tell you what that is. But <laughs> when I wrote the scene, which is somewhere near the end of the book, it made me laugh to write it because it was so dreadful and so awful, especially for someone like her. Um, sometimes the fun bit of being a writer is just really putting your characters through it. And, <laughs> and both of them go through it, yeah. They, they really do. And uh, it, it is a comedy. I mean, it is very funny. And there are, there's that wonderful thing that you just constantly recognise things yourself. You know, you recognise the horrible boss. You recognise the feeling old and fat and frumpy. You recognise mm. somebody doing you down. You recognise your, your bits of incredible, everyone's bits of incredible sort of vanity. You know, Nisha just sort of mm. feels so naked without her multi-thousand pound wardrobe. wardrobe and you, yeah. No one doesn't actually have that Chloe Shearling coat that she does. That without your, your props through life, you will feel incredibly vulnerable. And that's but, what fascinated me. It's like, who mm. are you by this age? I mean, I, 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 I put them in their late 40s, but I'm 53. But you have a uniform. You've become used to being a certain way. You know, when I wore glasses, my glasses were part of my uniform. Mm. And, and it, it asked the question, who are you when all that is stripped away and all that is left is your character? You know, and, and what both of them come to depend on is actually the solidarity of other women um, to kind of rebuild themselves. And that was an it's, important thing as well, a, an important part of the book. It's a buddy book as much it as... It is a buddy any, book, yeah. I mean, Sam has her wonderful, wonderful best friend who has, you know, arrives in, in the novel here and there, but as a presence is just kind mm. of marvellous. You just desperately want to, and she is having a very hard time herself. Um, but Nisha has to find a friend because she just doesn't have any really. All yeah, the she's... very wealthy people that she knows, well, they don't want to know her without mm. everything, all her, all her um, entourage. They don't want to know her and she has to find a friend and she is not a woman who likes other women particularly. No, I'm always struck by these women who say, I'm not really a girl's girl. And I just think, how on earth do you survive life if, you, if you're not a girl's girl? I mean, I am so highly dependent on my close friends. I've had the same best friend since I was 16. Um, I, I just wouldn't know how to navigate the world without their yeah. advice. And, and, you know, one of the things I wanted to show in, in these relationships was you can be quite irritable with each other. You can be sarcastic with each other. You can take the mickey out of each other. But ultimately, it's about that kind of solidarity. And I think the other thing that interests me about being this age in terms of other women is by the time you get to your, if you're lucky enough to get to your 40s and 50s, we are all survivors of something. And mm. whereas in your 20s, you, there might have been an element of competition or you know, judgment, what I find really interesting about being this age is if I walk into a room full of strangers, women who are strangers to me, within minutes, we are actually on the real stuff. How are you? What have you survived? The depressed children, the, the unhappy marriage, the, 
you know, the parents who require 24 hour care, just all these things, women just immediately get into it, empathize, try and work out ways to help each other. And that's what I wanted to show, because I think too often in, in narratives, when you see women together, they are placed in competition or in some kind of conflict. And that's so far from my own experience that I wanted to just show what I get, which is just, mm -hmm. you know, love and sarcastic jokes and irritation. I mean, the relationship Sam uh, has with Andrea, although they're very close, they're also quite rude to each other yeah. in a kind of British way. And I, I think there's a certain thing with British humour where you're kind of rudest to the people that you love most. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a term of endearment, you know, um, Absolutely. it's, it's, it's they, they always say my sisters in law are occasionally very rude to me and they always say, you need to worry if we're ignoring you. And yes. the first 15 years I started to sort of relax with that. So I thought, okay, that's right. And you know, it's absolutely right. Isn't it? You, you can yeah. be, because you know that there is something underpinning it. Now, really, this, this book is a caper. It is a farce. There are lots mm. of very funny, there are coincidences. There are, goodness, there are car chases. And <laughs> nobody wants a book without a car chase, really. All books yeah. are improved by car chases and accidents with cars. Um, but there is a lot of serious stuff in there. You've alluded to, to some of it. Sam's parents are very, very difficult. They are not supportive. They're also great sort of comic uh characters but we wouldn't want to have them as a, i mean i don't know if they you know you know parents like that or have experience but you wouldn't want to have them yourself would you no they're monstrous but in a <laughs> in a kind of relatable way i mean i you know this is one of the things i talk to my friends about a lot at this age which is i think elderly parents just become more themselves you know a more kind of extreme version of themselves and you know it, there's a sort of childlike quality that happens as they get particularly old where suddenly you're the one taking care of them and most women I know are doing a degree of that um even if they're not quite as bad as Sam's parents I mean aren't they aren't they just and we also have horribly well one horribly coercive husband yes we yes. don't well let's well I know we again once again we can't talk too much about him no, but I will say uh, that he's in the book, but he is horrible. Yes, but one of the most fun parts of researching this book, um, he is the woman, he is the man, sorry, who uh, announces he's going to divorce Nisha. And one of the fun bits of research was having a couple of dinners with a high end divorce lawyer who told me all the hideous ways yes. in which high net worth individuals um, kind of destroy each other during divorces and that was so eye-opening I mean it makes even the version I I wrote in the book is less than the stories she told me it yeah I mean there is a certain category of very wealthy man for whom divorce is a matter of winning or losing it's not about just separating and moving on some of them cannot bear to be seen to lose in the matter of maintenance. And she said they will literally go around the globe divesting themselves of assets and bankrupting themselves in order not to pay the amount that the judge has said they owe. Um, and yeah, it's extraordinary the lengths to which they will go to. And yeah, I could have written a whole book just on that subject I'm, alone. I'm not surprised. I mean, I mean the, the fact that actually a woman at, at that point is seen entirely as a possession to also yes. be got rid of and the fact that you may leave her high and dry emotionally scarred mm. materially destitute is unimportant so that i mean one of the things i really got from this book that is that you know the lives of the super rich are somewhat different to those of the rest of us yeah and that's i mean i've had a very strange career the first 10 years as a novelist i was not terribly successful and then the second 10 years i've been a lot more successful and what that success has given me is occasional access into the lives of people who are very successful and very wealthy. And I can tell you, they do not live like you or I. Um, yeah. And I find that fascinating. And, and also just if you looked at Nisha from the outside, what you would see is a very wealthy, glamorous woman who looks like she has it all. And the thing you realize when you get to this age is nobody has it all. There is a no. price for everything. And in her case, 
she only realizes the price she has been paying as she kind of grows as a result of having to kind of completely rebuild her life. I think she has been in denial for years because she's been conditioned to see her life a certain way. And it's afterwards when she looks at that life that suddenly she's forced to reassess everything. You also, of course, deal with other things that happen in marriages that are less dramatic on the surface, but are, mm. are horrible underneath. As you, you know, we were saying at the beginning that Sam is in a long marriage. It's had all sorts of difficulties. Um, mm. and, you know, financially, there is a sort of uncertainty there. But there is a very, very interesting question at the heart of this book. That what do you do if suddenly your partner is challenged in a way that changes them completely? Her husband, is, as you said, becomes very depressed they become mm. almost, in, you know, separated, really, but within mm. the same marriage. And what do you do? How do you cope with that? It's really hard. And I mean, I've never had a, a, a husband who was catatonically depressed, but I have <laughs> friends who've had family members who have suffered in the same way. And um, the answer is, to some extent, there's only so much you can do. And, and also, I think at the beginning, I wanted to set up a situation where you're almost irritated by him because you see Sam holding up the world and just running herself ragged, trying to keep the whole show on the road. And you're thinking, why is this guy just lying on the sofa watching Homes Under the Hammer kind of thing? And then later you start to see things from his perspective and you realize this is a man who has suffered himself and gone through a terrific trauma that he feels unable to share because of his own conditioning as a man. And I think one of the things that I wanted to show in, in this book was just the importance, perhaps especially if you're a man, of just talking. Because mm -hmm. I think in Britain especially, we don't encourage men to talk. I think that the, the conversation is changing, but I think men suffer equally, um, but probably more in silence. And you know, it's when he finally starts to talk that his life begins to change. There's another part. I'm going to get some some questions from the audience. Mm. People are people are saying a lot of people just a lot of love for you. You're amazing. Somebody oh, said that we nice. always we always pass things like that on because we don't. We need to be told that. No, Thank we you. do. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> but um, another part of this book is that. Nisha, again, we won't we won't go into sort of real detailed spoilers, but she does have to join the real world. She is on her own two feet. Mm. Actually, she does have some resources that we we gradually find out about that you know she she can draw on. But she's plunged into the world of very, very, very low paid shift workers mm. with no security, with yeah. very little money, with perhaps with no time, with no space. Yeah. Uh, and we all know um that Clearly, that is an eye opener. But I thought, yeah. I mean, that, clearly that took a lot of research because that wasn't just sketched in, Jojo. I mean, you really, you know, you you no, I did about I that to people. detail. What did yeah. you What did you do to sort of make that picture? Well, you know, I spent kind of ten years travelling the globe and mm. spending a lot of time in hotels. And one of the things I make it my business to do is to talk to people. And I think because I'm an unthreatening small lady of certain years um <laughs> people do talk to me I, I have one of those faces it's quite easy to get people to open up um and and there is a certain level of job insecurity and as you say lack of time that's the big thing a lot of the people who are working in hotels and and in that kind of job are also doing other jobs because you cannot survive on one salary and they're being paid under the table you know a lot of these are un um undocumented workers. Uh, I'm, I guess one of the themes I return to again and again in my work is exactly this, because although I've never been an undocumented worker, I feel like in my life, I have in my family and in the years that I've been working, moved through several sections of society. I, I, my first job was as a cleaner. So mm. I feel like I have some lived experience of it, although I was much, much younger. I've worked in bars. I've worked in a minicab office. Um, a lot of those things come from direct experience. And now I think the situation is more extreme. Now there are far greater extremes of wealth and social opportunity than there were when I was growing up. So, um, yeah, I think it's, 
it's almost impossible to ignore that as a writer. I feel like it's such a huge part of society today, the difference. And, you know, it's like upstairs, downstairs. We're all fascinated by what goes on in the unseen bits. But, yeah, for me, it just, I, I, I feel like I can't write a book without it. Jojo, um, one of the questions we, we've had is, uh, is tell us a little bit about your process. Now, you, you talked a bit, uh, a bit there. It was from Ian Wilfred. Uh, is, tell us a bit about your process. Now, you, you were saying that actually pandemic writing, not easy at all. But in general, if we, we bet without a pandemic, what's the sort of normal thing for you? Um, in general, my books come from snippets of news or, or just things that I've seen on the internet that lodge somewhere in my head. And then I find I kind of marinate them for a while and see if I can work out whether there's an actual plot attached. For me, the biggest thing is character. Mm. Um, I, I, I feel very strongly that if you, you can have the greatest plot or the greatest writing in the world, but if you don't care about the characters, you're not going to take anything away from that. So I do most of my planning on character. Um, I devise histories for them. I want to know where they grew up, what kind of parents they had, uh, what how kind of thing they lived in, um, what's in their bag, what's in their fridge, all these little tests that tell you who somebody is. And um, apart from that, I am a planner. I'm not a fly by the seat of the pants uh, um, I do have a rough idea where my plots are going, where the kind of climactic moments are going to be, where the twists are. I, I don't know how people do twists if they haven't planned them. I don't know how that works. I have a huge ad admiration for people who can just set off and see where they go, but that would make me sweat. And this is a, this is a really sort of nuts and bolts practical question, but some people who love that level of detail who write have it all around them, you know, bits and pieces, um, stuck to the walls music yes. somebody might be listening to you know a character might like are you that definitely. sort of person that kind of immersive person definitely when when the british newspaper library was at collindale i mm. would depending on when my setting was i would go to collindale and i would get all the newspapers for that period a good selection and i would print them out and put them all over my office wall because what that gives you is a sense of people's preoccupations of the day um, what the kind of refrigerators were like, what the names were, what the language was. And that, I feel, infuses your writing. Um, and, and it gives you just really useful detail, the kind of stuff that brings thing, things alive. My last book, The Giver of Stars, was set in Kentucky in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So I actually went to Kentucky three times in different seasons so that I could hear the rhythms of the language because it's quite ornate. It's very mm -hmm. different from other parts of America. And I wanted to experience what it, have been, what it would have been like riding those mountain trails and what flowers would have been out, what herbs, what, what it would have been like at nighttime on a mountainside. All those things, I think, feed into your narrative. And they also give you plot strands that you didn't expect. I'm, I'm a big, big believer in boots on the ground when it comes to, to research lot of love here for giver of stars and i mean oh. you're not somebody who wants to write one book over and over again are you i mean that is not no no, no this I is number 16 right this is book is. Number yeah i don't think you know, this one and the last the one could be any further apart <laughs> listen somebody yeah. has actually asked and i this is well look i'm gonna ask you you can choose to answer this in any okay. which way it's difficult for writers somebody doesn't really want to wait three and a half years for the it's next. not going to be three and a half years for uh, the next one. Is there anything that you're working on that you can say anything about? Um, I am working on another contemporary novel, but I haven't got to 20,000 words yet. And 20,000 words is my cutoff point for ideas. I, I often work out whether something is going to work sometime around that point. So I have a lot of unfinished started novels so I always get a bit suspicious uh, superstitious until I get to that point because I don't want to say yes this is going to work and I want to tell you all about it until I know I'm probably at 50,000 words but all I can tell you is it's contemporary uh it's not a conventional romance and hopefully it's got some humor but if it goes according to plan it will also be a bit of a heartbreaker so, somebody says a final question here um 
Will you be writing a backstory for any of the grumpy women in your portrait collection? I love <laughs> seeing them. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> I, yeah, um, just to explain, in lockdown, I developed a habit um, of looking at the website saleroom.com, which basically shows you things from every tiny little auction house across Britain and beyond. And I became um, obsessed by kind of unwanted pictures of really grumpy women. And I started collecting them because they're quite easy to buy because nobody wants them. Um, nobody wants a judgy, <laughs> disappointed woman looking down at them. And I think I've, I've got about eight so far. Some of them are very beautiful. Some of them, the postage costs more than the portrait. Um, and I did have an idea about writing a book of short stories uh, based well, on each one. So that may happen. But I also know that short stories are a tough sell. So I might have to do that in what passes for my free time. Well, but I can see how they might be linked. And maybe if you started to write those backstories, they would all coalesce. Mm. They wouldn't even necessarily be short stories. I'm sorry, I think this is a goer. As a reader, I think this is a goer. I can okay. see you sitting here in a few years' time talking about these these grumpy women. Okay, I, I wish I had one next to me because I would hold one up. But if, <laughs> if any of the um, uh, audience want to see them, there's quite a few of them on my Instagram. Um, Jojo, I'm going to ask about, asking my own question. I'm afraid you're going to have to tell us now. And this is something we, we got used to not asking people as we communicated via screens. But since this book is about shoes, I, I mean, are you, are you wearing some particular, are you more Louboutin or flip-flop today? And if that is just too difficult, just tell us a little bit about your favourite pair of shoes. Okay, I'm going to show you what I'm wearing. <laughs> <laughs> my really glamorous slippers. Um, I'm, I'm a basically a big clumpy boot person. I bought a pair of boots about two and a half years ago, and I think I probably wear them five days a week. Uh, I feel like since, you know, over the last few years, we've all got used to walking everywhere. None of us really go anywhere or few of us went anywhere where you could wear dressy shoes. I love them occasionally, but, um, no, I'm a, a flat shoe trainer or walking the dogs in a pair of old brown leather boots kind of person now. And do you have a pair of red strappy Louboutins? Well, do you know what? I wish I had them in the room. My publishers yesterday, as a celebration of my publication, bought me they're not high heels, but they are the most extraordinary pair of red, shiny red Louboutin shoes. But the heel is kind of clumpy and that big. But they look like Dorothy's shoes from The Wizard of Oz, oh. but just not sequined, just bright red. And I, I was actually speechless when they gave them to me. I don't think I've ever been given anything that beautiful in my life. And I wish I had them to hand because they are absolutely stunning and I didn't even realize Christian Louboutin didn't do shoots that weren't high heels um, we didn't th we didn't think that was that was the basis of the no of the and I'm I'm going to do an event at Henley on Wednesday and I'm going to wear them because they are just the most exotic and lovely things I've ever seen yeah I think I think you have to and I think possibly we might go so far as unless they sort of you know are not comfortable which I imagine very expensive shoes usually are aren't they because they're yeah. made totally different way i say this for i imagine is the key word there i don't actually know uh but i think if they are comfortable you should probably wear them for every event for this book i would say i will post them on instagram <laughs> afterwards if anybody's interested jojo i think we all will that was, it was such fun to talk to you and what a brilliant way to start the weekend thank you so much this thank is you. I, so much i just i kind of fell into it it was i just wanted to keep reading i'm desperate to know what happened oh, next so kind. and i was wish absolute you know damnation on the book's baddies and you know it didn't entirely disappoint not a spoiler um thank you so much um everybody you can you can buy the book wherever you wish we we'd love you to buy it from an independent bookshop or you can go to the literary salons uh site and buy it through bookshop.org as jojo said you, you'll be doing events you'll keep us posted on instagram and elsewhere mm. what they are Jojo Moyes, thank you so much. This video will be, you'll be able to watch it, watch it again and spread it far and wide. Thank you so, so much, Jojo. And congratulations once again. 
Thank you, Alex. And thank you to everyone who's posting these lovely comments. I've never done one of these. And there's something really lovely about seeing the love hearts and the nice comments. It's really cheering. So it's, thank it's you. It's brilliant everyone. instant feedback gratification loop, isn't it? It's wonderful. Thank you all it's so lovely. much. Go and enjoy Thank all you for coming. Bye. 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 A huge thank you to the brilliant Jojo Moyes and Alex Clark in conversation there. And thank you to you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Now, if you're a bit of a JJ fan, you might want to have a look through our back catalogue on the podcast as we have been lucky enough to launch several of JJ's books over the years. And Damien's had some wonderful chats with her at salons. So do take a look at those. Also, keep an eye out on our Instagram. As I said, we'll be doing more of these live interviews with authors. It's a really, really nice way to get to interact with your favourite authors, ask them questions and just enjoy some good bookish chat. So do keep your eyes peeled. Give us a follow if you haven't already. Our handle is at Damien Bar Literary Salon and we would love to see you over on Instagram. Thank you for listening and join us again soon.